Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash this weekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Use the code TWIST7 when signing up to save 10%. And by GoToMeeting. Sign up for GoToMeeting and use the promo code START for your free 30-day trial. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups. We've got a special treat for you. Mark Suster is here. He's one of the most vocal and active uh, venture capitalists out there, former entrepreneur, now venture capitalist, both sides of the table, host of This Week in Venture Capital. He's going to talk about everything related to raising money, the current economy, angel investing, and uh, what he's up to. So stick with us. It's going to be an awesome, awesome episode. What it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Ah, uh, hey everybody, hey everybody, it's This Week in Startups. You know this program, we're about 2,790 2, episodes in, no, 279 episodes in, my God, am I tired. What is this program about? It's about entrepreneurship, it's about startup companies, it's about making a dent in the universe, it's about trying to change the world by making new products and services that you're passionate about. It's not hard, it's not easy, it's hard. It's very hard, but programs like this are designed to give you a little bit of an edge a little bit of extra information, perhaps even a little inspiration at times, to make that journey easier. And today we have an epic guest. Mark Susser is with me. He's one of my old friends here from Los Angeles, venture capitalist, blogger at both sides of the tables, and of course, host of This Week in Venture Capital, previously host of This Week in Venture Capital. Welcome back to the program. I'm glad to be here. It's been uh, about two and a half years since I've been on your show. Yeah, it's amazing. God, yeah. and um, things are going amazing for you guys. You have the launch pad. Yes, You true. just graduated a whole group of people, so we're going to hear about that. I want to talk to you about the... The, I got a whole list of questions from the audience, number one. Great. So number, and number two, I want to talk about uh, your big announcement, which we'll do after the commercial break. Number three, I want to talk about the explosion of all these accelerators, because you've got your own, and are they really producing great companies or not? What's going on in the stock market with Facebook's shares and Zynga? Is it all over? There's so much to talk about. But before we get started, I want to just take a moment to thank GoToMeeting, GoToMeeting. You take a lot of meetings a week. I'm going to guess you take about 20. Okay. 10, 20? Yeah, probably 20. 20, 20 minutes, right? yeah. That means like three, what's that? That's four a day, yep. something like that? Yeah. Two in the morning, two in the afternoon, something yep. like that. It's never ending. And I'm like a part-time angel and I take 10 a week. Yep. You've got to be taking 20 as a full-time venture capitalist. And when you do them, you ever have anybody like, oh, hey, Skype in or let's use this free service and then the meeting doesn't start on time? Yep, all the time. And you want to bang your head against the wall. Yep. This is what happens. People will use these free services and they get what they pay for and then people are trying to find people's handles on Google Talk or this or that and it doesn't work. If you use GoToMeeting, you send a short URL. You ever do a GoToMeeting? Yes. and They and work flawlessly. Can, can I just tell you, I yeah. prefer GoToMeeting. Uh, I don't want to mention other names, but all too often I get introduced to download this, that app. And, and where the first 10 or 15 minute gets lost is I have to download some Java applet and it yeah. takes forever. Reboot. Yeah, and I had it installed on Chrome, but they want me to log in yes. on Firefox. Yes, and exactly. And 10, 15 minutes is wasted. And that's 10 or 15 minutes. The entrepreneur could be telling their story, can't asking you questions. That. You can't afford to do it. Get GoToMeeting where one click, the meeting starts. I use it. I've been using it for years. It works flawlessly. I don't let other people set my meetings. So here's a little tip for you, either as an investor, angel investor, or as an entrepreneur. Don't let the other party set the meeting. Just set up the go-to meeting and say, the go-to meeting is set up. Here's the link. And then let them say, oh, no, 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 no. We want to use this other inferior product. And, then, and you know what? They're not going to. GoToMeeting just works. It's totally stable. They have all these servers dedicated to HD video. And if you use the promo code START, you'll get 30 days for free. If you are a fan of this program, really the number one thing you can do is tweet at GoToMeeting. Thank you for sponsoring This Week in Startups. Independent media like this would not be possible without the fine folks at GoToMeeting. And also, meetings would not be possible. Stable, on-time meetings without GoToMeeting. So I just want to thank them uh, for being a great product that I use. And as you guys know, here at This Weekend, we have our choice of sponsors, people like me and Mark Suster. We're not going to read any ad. We're going to read advertisements for products that we love. That's our concept here as a startup. That's our little dent in the universe. That's our little innovation. We don't read a commercial unless it's a product we love. And then it's not really a commercial. It's more like, me, as Jason Calacan, is telling you about something that gives me value in my life. 
It's an authentic transfer of enthusiasm. I'm enthusiastic about GoToMeeting, and you will be too. I guarantee it. And if you don't uh, like it, you know, uh, you're crazy, number one, and I'll buy you a beer. Anyway, um, so welcome back to the program. You've been super busy. Yes. Uh, word on the street is your VC firm, GRP, raising another fund. Are you allowed to talk? I mean, I know there's a lot of rules around this. Like when you're raising funds, people allowed to talk about it, not allowed to talk about it. The SEC, you know, sort of monitors this kind of stuff. It's strange. Let me just say this, yeah. that uh, the SEC has rules uh, for investors not to be seen to be soliciting or marketing their fund broadly. And why is that? Why, why can't you solicit? Like, if you're Sequoia Capital and you've, you invested in Google or, you know, you're Excel and you invested in Facebook, why can't you tweet, hey, we're the ones who invested in Facebook and made a 7,000% return. We're raising a new fund. Why can't they do that? Well, I think... First of all, obviously, the rules are designed to try and protect investors. Right. So good intent there. Yeah, it's good intent. But the problem is that regulation seldom keeps up with changes in technology, changes in industry. Mm. So if you look at crowdfunding, for example, everyone's super excited about crowdfunding. I'm a little bit more... Um, Muted? Muted. Great word. Damn, I was looking for the right word. Yeah. Um, is, does damn require me to no, kick in money? No, no, just the seven dirty okay. words. If you want to say the S, the oh, F, the C. I can't C. say the George Carlin. Yeah, just go right down the list, and yeah. that's seven times 10, 70 <laughs> bucks. You buy us a keg. It I goes towards actually, the keg fund. I can do that George Carlin routine, but I won't on this show. It's if gonna... you you can do it, I tell you what, do it at the end. Yeah. We'll bleep it. Okay. We'll be like, you just be like beep 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 beep. So you don't have if to you worry about me, saying the c word. If you remove seventy bucks me. goes in the jar, yeah. and then you bought the crew a keg. There you anyway, go. Anyway, keep going. So you're um, muted on crowdfunding. Yeah, but Why? but my reason is simple: is I think the broad majority of investors are unsophisticated, and I don't okay. mean that in a kind way. I mean it really unsophisticated, meaning a lot of, e even angels, even people who are well-meaning, even people who have 100K to blow, often don't understand the intricacies of liquidation preferences. They don't understand the intricacies of preferred rights and the rights that preferred shareholders have to do to common stockholders. They often don't realize that when a company doesn't immediately move up into the right, often early investors get washed out. They don't understand that when you split the pie, it's not split based on the percentage you own. First, preference is taken off the top and then it splits. So you could feel like you own one and a half percent of a company and in the end your proceeds might be 0.2 or might be zero. Um, and if you don't have deep enough pockets to follow your investment, then you also can get crushed. Yeah. And here's These are all incredible nuances that I am experiencing as an angel. Yeah, and I have yeah. as well. So yeah. um, I'd, I'd like to consider myself somewhat sophisticated. I will just say this, yeah. and I don't mean to make it a big plug, but on both sides of the table, at the yeah. very top, I have a thing called, uh, I think, angel topics or something. Yeah. And I list what I view as the risks for angel investors. You know, but here's the thing is... Uh, people are blindly throwing money into companies, and in a booming market like we've seen in the tech market from 2009 to 2012, everything feels like it's going well. You only will experience what happens to angel investors when we get our next correction in the tech market. Right. And when it does, I think people will become more sophisticated because we saw this happen in 08. We saw sure. it happen in 2001, 2, and 3. Uh, when the tide goes out, you can find out who's naked. Exactly. And I would just say one more thing, which is, and I feel this about a lot of the secondary markets for buying shares. As a preferred stockholder in the company and what they call a major investor, major investor usually means you own 5% of the company or more. Right. Sometimes it Founder, can be said at 1%, yeah. 2%, but often it's 5%. And what major investors do is they demand rights. And the rights is, well, first of all, I might say I want a board seat. Therefore, I know everything going on. But if I don't get a board seat, I might demand investor uh, information rights. I get to see everything. I get to see the books. I get to see exactly. the P&L. I get to see the minutes from the board meeting, the yeah. presentation from the board meeting. And yes. trust me when I say, as your 25K that goes into a $2 million round, you're seeing bupkis. Yeah. Okay. No and, insights. You no know, insights. And by the way, you might be investing in people in your general community that you can call up and say, bro, yeah. what's going on, right? Now- so the bro what's going on type investors, I accept have a little more influence in getting information out of companies than Joe Public. Joe Public is going to have no ability to say, hey, bro, can if you tell I me what's If I put 100 bucks in, in a crowdfunding site in a $2 million round or 200, I don't really have any right to information. Yeah. And let's call I it am basically 
just gambling two hundred dollars. Let's call it a thousand bucks, okay? Okay, a thousand. And the reason I pick on a thousand is that we it's in a mortgage our mortgage payment. Well, we in our you know white lily world of you know a thousand bucks is like a nice meal out with four friends, right? Right. Uh, but neither you nor I grew up with money. Right. And I know that for many people in this country, a thousand dollars is a lot. Um, it's a mortgage payment. Sometimes it's rent. Sometimes it's uh, you know, a quarter of a kid's uh, let's be, tuition. Let's be truthful. Sometimes it's the difference between evicted, being evicted and being not evicted. Absolutely. And, um, and so those are the people I worry about. Now, what happened in NASDAQ in 98, 99, 2000 is many people fancied themselves as stock pickers. So they started putting money. My brother was one of them, my little brother. And he told me I'm earning more as an investor than I am in my day job. So he was a day trader. Yeah. So he's buying Yahoo or he's yeah. buying till he whatever. lost everything. Right. Literally everything. Lost everything. Buying the and globe. <laughs> my, my brother can afford to, and he was in his twenties and it didn't matter. And right. you know, you live to fight another day. But for other people, there is no comeback. But now all these crowdfunding sites are gonna have limitations. You're gonna be able to only invest one percent of your annual income or something, and you get, the companies are gonna have to work with a registered broker or dealer, I guess. So there's gonna be some safeguards. But, but let's go back to regulation. Yeah. And regulation obviously um, can have a very negative impact mm -hmm. on markets but it's designed in purpose to protect. So if I look at, for example, filing uh, regulations on NASDAQ and uh, S&P, mm -hmm. um, or the New York Stock Exchange, rather, sorry, N NYSE or NASDAQ, um, they have reporting requirements and they make you sign the document as a legal yep. representative that the numbers aren't fraudulent and you can go to jail if you like. Sure, Dennis Klaus Kozlowski. Yeah, and, ma and many others. Um, and I look at, for example, the shadow markets. So, for example, you have something called AIM in mm -hmm. London. Are you familiar with AIM? No. So, in London, you have the LSE, the London Stock, Stock Exchange, Exchange yep. and AIM, which is the Alternative Investment Management yep. or something like that. I may be getting what it stands for wrong. But in every market, you had these emerging uh, uh, trading platforms that were designed to not have the same regulation as the big. Lighter, faster, yeah. more risk. And in 97, 98, 99, 2000, all those felt great. So there was one in Germany called the Neuermarkt, hmm. the newer market, Neuermarkt. Right. Um, and every country had these. And what ended up happening was no transparency, you had no access to information, limited regulation. So guess, you know, you, you've probably heard of this term called selective bias. Yeah. Selective bias says that the data or the companies that end up associating themselves with those markets select those markets because they're not capable of being right. on LSC. Um, and therefore, you end up with worse companies by definition, but unsophisticated investors. Right. And I think we blew a generation of retail investors, meaning not the big institutions, but retail People don't investors. trust the stock market. I mean, yeah. we're seeing it now. For that reason. Facebook and Zynga and all these companies are getting just crushed in the market, mm -hmm. and there is no retail appetite to buy them. Yeah, and there shouldn't be. And there shouldn't be. Why? So... The best analogy I heard was from a big money market manager, and he said, imagine this. Imagine you are looking at the NBA, and you know you see LeBron and you know his yeah. team, Wade and everybody, and you think, God, I can hit some three points. I'm going to get in the game, right. and I'm going to bet $10,000 that I can play in this game and, and hold my own. Like, you're going to get freaking crushed, right? Yeah, it's demolished. Demolished. You will the, get the ball past half court. But for, for two reasons. One is they're just physically better than you. Right. And two is they play every day, all day, their entire life, and you're right. a hack, right? You've yeah. got a day job. And the same is true in the stock market. You have these people who have resources you don't have in terms of computing resource and yeah. teams Tools, of people doing analysis, whatever. Yeah. And they do this all day, every day. And trust me when I say they're at dinners where I can't say inside information is passed, but they know a lot more than you do. Right. It's pretty clear they're at the golf course or dinners. And those are the people who are moving the markets, not you and me. It's not yeah. the retail It's a sucker's investor. game. As, it is a sucker's as, game. As uh, Mark Cuban would say. But that being said, if there is no retail appetite for these companies, then the companies are getting valued at bargain basement prices. If you... No, I don't believe that. Um, 
you may make money on Zynga or Facebook, so that's not my argument. Right. But uh, the prices are not driven by retail investors. The prices are driven by institutional investors. Right, people who will buy and a couple so, of percentage yeah, points in If it. you want to kick in our mythical $1,000 yeah. and you can afford to lose that and you have an instinct that Zynga $2.23 billion is undervalued. With $1.6 billion in cash and a billion plus in revenue. Knock your socks off right. and go. Just understand that that is a bet. And yeah. gambling, Just like any other bet. gambling's legal in Vegas, and this is an educated bet. Yeah, it's a it's worth a, making, yeah. but you're still playing against LeBron, and he's going to kick your butt in general if you think you can pick better Absolutely. than LeBron. So uh, when you see Kickstarter happening and people picking winners on there, people have some knowledge of a product they like. Does that change it a little bit in your mind? So like, I'm an educated consumer. I know I like Groupon. Well, let's take I Ouya. know I like Facebook. Let's take Ouya. Do you know Ouya? Yeah, the um, video game. Yeah, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah, it's, it's like ooh yeah. It's the yeah. it's the Android o video game. U Y A. Yeah. So they broke all the records on Kickstarter. Yeah, so five million or something. Yeah. Insane. Well, they you know they five point nine. Here it is on my computer. Yeah. Last time when I first looked in their first incarnation, they had raised two point seven million, wow. and then I looked again, it was five million. Now it's five point nine million. Uh, what I think that suggests is that consumers are voting with their pocketbooks that this is something they would like to see happen. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it may happen. Right. And I'm a, uh, I would love to see it happen. Right. I have called many ins insiders to ask what they think. Yeah. And they're pretty skeptical on yeah. whether it will actually happen. Now, by the way, I'm as in be a, and when you say happen, you mean be a successful product in business. Well, they don't have a product. They're right. taking the money to build the product, to launch yes. the product. And by the way, skepticism um, does not mean a company won't succeed. And I'm rooting for Ouya to succeed. And yes. I have actually talked to the founding team, and I'm I'm a fan right. of the idea. How but, is this changing as, venture, though? I mean, as a venture capitalist, putting on your venture hat, yeah. obviously things have risk. You want people with big, audacious goals, and clearly you want people who can get traction with consumers. And having 40,000 consumers actually take out a credit card before a product exists and put up $5.9 million, that has to be some indication to you that Trust there me, is something it makes in your, this general. makes your ears percolate. Exactly. So every VC in the world goes and meets with these folks. Do they need VCs now? Is this going to disintermediate VCs? Some people are saying that. Well, just like I don't believe AngelList disintermediated VCs, and I don't believe seed funding or, or yeah. angels in general disintermediate VCs, let me say it simply this way. The more companies that get started with half a million, one million, two million, whatever yeah. amount it takes to get started, the more of those that are created, the better it is for venture capitalists. Why? Because venture capitalists, by and large, it depends on the size of the VC, are looking to write three, five, eight million dollar checks sometimes. For ten percent or twenty percent of the company. Usually, the minimum most VCs want is twenty. Right. And twenty percent for five million, for yeah, three million. If they like can't that. get it, they'll take fifteen if it's super hot. But yeah. they they want a meaningful stake, and for reasons I can explain in a moment. But all it gives them is more shot on goal. And what's actually more shot on goal. More right. shots on goal. Like yeah. um, you know, if, if I have. 10 companies in Los Angeles to look at investing in, okay, I got to pick the one or two best from those yeah. 10. If there are 100 created, sure. Chances of finding more opportunities the next or, you know, to pick yeah. my one or two deals, right? So let's just say my pipeline is wider. Now, here's what you have to understand about venture capital. Um, in the 90s, the amount of money that went into VCs to then fund entrepreneurs on average was about $15 billion a year. Mm. In three years, the late 90s, that went from $15 billion to $110 billion in the year yeah. 2000. Now, that money is committed for 10 years, so it doesn't go away right away. Right. The weird thing- of those limited partners, the people who give the venture capitalists the money to invest, they cannot back out. If they do, Correct. it's a huge price to pay. Correct. It's seppuku. Correct. They kill themselves. It's what? Seppuku, like a ritualized suicide. Uh, if I don't okay. put, make my commitments as a limited partner, gotcha. I lose everything in the fund. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mostly, it's yeah. their it's technicalities, but you do lose a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Do, do they call it, they call it Harry Carry, right? Harry Carry is yeah. another way to say spooky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I learn something new every day. Yeah. Um, and what ha the irony about ten-year funds is most ten-year funds last twelve years. Right. I so don't know why like, I call them ten-year funds. It takes They're, them five six years to invest it, and then it takes another five or six years to to figure out what to do with these companies. The I mean, normal Fred time Wilson still has people from Flatiron Partner yes. Fund. The, the normal time horizon is you invest for three to four years, and then you start exiting in year seven through 10. But the reality is you still have five, six, seven companies at the end of 10 years. So you can either sell them in a secondary market, 
-hmm. and just exit, or you can continue to manage them. And then the LPs just have to be okay with that. And if the fund is in the black, the VCs, or the limited partners, would be like, hey, let it ride. Or maybe they want the gravy. I think what generally happens? it's nuanced. I think the LPs would take a view. If they believed that there was two or three X the value by waiting, mm. they would say, wait, if they're growing impatient, they usually, if LPs act in concert, they can act against the VC. There are usually voting thresholds yeah. that if a certain number of LPs vote, they can force action. Are they coordinated like that? Do they go and look oh, yeah. go to Fred Wilson and say, oh, yeah. hey, listen, we're looking at the... We're looking at the Flatiron Partners Fund from 2001, and there's three things left. Just sell these for scrap. We want the money. I don't think anyone says anything negative to Fred Wilson because they're somehow the hoping that either they can invest in his next fund or continue yeah. investing if they were lucky enough to get in. Yeah. I mean, what's his ascension is pretty miraculous over the last decade. Completely miraculous. I mean, he But is, he's not a one-hit wonder. You just, I, I am amazed when I look at his People portfolio. thought he was a one-hit wonder when he just had GeoCities. And I should make it clear, one. I think USV is talented. I don't think it's all Fred. Fred no, gets all the credit. No, clearly Brad and these other folks are uh, contributing meaningfully. It's a great team. If you look at Albert, you know, mm -hmm. and the investment in TenGen, yeah. you know, which is MongoDB. Yep. That's Huge. impressive. That's a half-billion-dollar yeah. company now. Yeah, and they it's have Kevin Etsy. Ryan's company, right? They have now. Etsy. They have Kickstarter. Foursquare. They have Foursquare. They have... Tumblr. Tumblr. They have, I mean, on and on and on. Pincus and Zynga, Twitter. Obviously, they had Zynga. Obviously, they have Twitter. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Hey, when we get back, uh, let's hear your big announcement. And let me just take a moment to tell everybody about an amazing product, uh, actually out of New York, Squarespace. Squarespace is an amazing publishing platform that I, Jason Calacanis, used for the launch conference. And uh, they just came out with their new... Uh, version 6, and it is gorgeous. Look at these beautiful sites here. And, and that's what you're really getting with Squarespace, a gorgeous, delicious-looking site that is far and above um, the design templates you'll find anywhere else at a very, very affordable price. I keep telling these guys, too cheap, uh, raise the prices, but they tell me they just want to make the world a better place. Drag-and-drop features automatically resizes for the mobile version, so when you look on an iPad or you look on uh, your iPhone or Android phone or the web, it all just flows naturally. And hey, look, we made, uh, I told my guys like an hour ago, hey, make me Tyler, since Tyler's like too busy to come to work and he's been like in Sweden. Here's all Tyler's photos. We did this without permission. You can go to insightsfromsweden.squarespace.com. And I got to think Tyler's got a girlfriend in Sweden because I've never seen him go under the radar like this. I mean, he's just totally gone. Nobody can get in touch with them. It must be love. And I tell you, I'm in love with Squarespace for making this beautiful Tyler summer vacation tribute page. Literally, I had a non-technical person put this together in seconds by stealing all of Tyler's photos off of Facebook. The buy yearly plan gets you 20% off, and twi Twist listeners get another 10% off um, with the code TWIST7, T-W-I-S-T-7, and the number seven, that is. Go ahead and tell all your friends. Go ahead and tell your parents, your cousins. You get all these people at the holiday gatherings, at the 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day. I need to build a website. You're in the internet business. Can you build? You have this happen, right? People say like, oh, Mark, you invest in internet companies. I need to build a website for my dry cleaner. Can you yep. build it for us? Or do you know somebody who can build me a website? Sure. And you're like, I'm a venture capitalist. I mean, what? Build you a website? I mean, do you ask your dentist to like buy you toothpaste? Like, That's not normally how I respond, but fair enough. But I know, but that's what you <laughs> think, right? Because I'm, I'm thinking like, if I was a doctor and I came, you know, like to Christmas and then you asked me like, do I have Band-Aids? Do I know somebody with Band-Aids? I don't have Band-Aids. I'm a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Jeez. Anyway, you could be, uh, you can really help your family out and get them Squarespace. Just tell them, go get Squarespace and uh, go ahead and thank at Squarespace. And thanks for making version six. I mean, I know it's been a long time in the making, but what a beautiful, beautiful product. And uh, clearly Tyler's having a great time uh, in Sweden. And look at all these beautiful websites. I mean, just gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. The way it moves around, it's so fluid. It's all that HTML5 goodness, CSS, all that stuff. And um, they just do a great job. I can't tell you how fond I am of the product. We use it every day here. And I don't have to have technical people. So when I, you know, I don't have technical people at the launch event or at This Week in Startups. I can just ask them, like, you know, semi-technical people. Like, you know, people who know how to use Microsoft Office or know how to use Gmail. They're not coders, they're not programmers, they're not designers, but they can make stuff that looks like it was made by a designer or a programmer, and that's why Squarespace is so special. Go ahead and check out squarespace.com. Thanks, Squarespace. Okay, so uh, you did this week in venture capital. You got a huge following for yeah. that, and uh, you have a big announcement about that. Yes, well, 
you know, I sort of feel like arrested development. I went yeah. off the air for a period of time, right. and there's been these grumblings of why have I gone off the air. Right. And I went off the air for my own reasons. It's been almost a year, if you can believe yeah, that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, but we're bringing the show back. Awesome. Wow. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, and I'm super excited to yeah. come in and start doing the show the again. The show was, I mean, it's a really great show, and people love that you were so transparent about everything going on in your life and venture capital, but it's really hard to commit to doing the show, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a time commitment. I mean, I actually didn't mind the time commitment itself of actually doing the show. Right. I mean, my feeling was I spend my career either seeing companies, helping existing companies, or meeting new people. Right. And the meeting new people were usually doing things like debating what's going on in the VC industry and yeah. what do you think about Facebook and Zynga and yeah, yeah. How, how is the world changing. And so all I did was just shift those to on camera. Yeah, and you record them and everybody else gets to... Which I thought was great. And there's a weird thing about doing video with people is mm. you do develop this interesting bond. So, yes. you know, two years down the road, I have people still coming back to me saying, do you know how many people have commented about that. I'll tell you a funny thing. So Camille it is a is a really uh, interesting because the shows then wind up getting embedded yeah. in Google search or YouTube search. Well, Chameleonaire. Yeah, he's hip hop artist. Yeah, sure, you know, successful in yeah. his in his niche. Um, he's a he's a he's a dot com fanboy. He's an internet fanboy. So he told me that he started getting pulled aside at airports, and people said, "Hey, I saw you on Mark Suter's <laughs> show." That's fantastic. He had the biggest laugh about that. It was yeah. really funny. But I know for a fact. Um, a, an individual venture capitalist got a job as a result of being on the wow. show. Wow. Because it turns out that LPs, the people who invest in VC funds, actually watch the show. And oh. I only found that out as I traveled the country, possibly raising money, possibly sure. not. Yeah, exactly. Um, when you LPs. might have been meeting with LPs, yeah, and they might have brought up that they'd seen the show. Yes. And I was surprised. Well, I mean, it, it is a natural extension of what you did with your blog, right? Yeah. I mean, you basically were a new VC. I don't want to say nobody VC because you were an established entrepreneur, but you you were a nobody in the VC community. Sure. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, he's the West Coast version of Fred Wilson. Like yeah. he and or Brad Feld, you know, in, in Colorado. Like the blog really put you on the map. It helped. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of cynicism within the LP community and within other VCs about the idea of blogging. Yeah. And I've even heard it lobbied against Fred. And I just don't understand that mentality. I mean one of the things we all compete for is access to entrepreneurs. Yep. What, how does access work? Well, historically in Silicon Valley, it worked that you went to Stanford, you knew the professors, you graduated with a class, you knew 100 people, and they all started referring to people, people to you. And then you'd been in the Valley for 20 years, and suddenly, you know, all yep. the deals find you. Well, that those days are done, right? Yeah, now you can just instantly have a fun. Mike Arrington, yeah. Dave McClure... And um, I would say this goes on and on of people who have instantly become. Yeah. Well, like, instant is not as, as easy or instant as you think. And you can ask well, Dave McClure that. But instant on in terms of profile, but not success. Yeah. Right. Instantly, they got up and running. Yes. Right. And, and, and I would say this to you, which is um, when we advise entrepreneurs, we would say technology is changing your industry. Mm. Technology is making your industry more transparent and it's making it easier for customers to get direct access to you. Mm. So my mentality was keeping a blog is just having a way for me to have a dialogue with my potential customers. Right. Now here's the other interesting thing is, it turns out ad agencies read it. It turned out brands read it. It turns ah. out that other VCs read it. So it becomes it. a tool for your portfolio companies to Abs get. Absolutely. Uh, a little bit of attention. But Fred Wilson sometimes does, he's a very strongly opinionated guy, and yeah. he can have sharp elbows at times. We've been friends for a long time. Yeah. I think all three of us have sharp elbows at times. At times. Uh, sometimes technical fouls happen, even yeah. amongst uh, competitors. You know, when he says, like, Yahoo's dead to me, mm -hmm. and he's got a portfolio of 15 companies or 25 companies that might need to have a relationship with Yahoo, does that make you, does that give you pause? Like, so it's a very interesting question, Jason, which is that I feel three years ago when I was less well known, I just said whatever I wanted on my blog. And if you've been reading my blog for that long, you'll realize that over the course of the last year or so, I have toned down the negative messages. Yeah. And it's for that reason. Like if I say anything against Apple or Yahoo or Google, even Goodwilled, mm -hmm. uh, I hear about it the next day from portfolio companies. Yeah. So you have to basically be responsible knowing that your what you say your behavior people impacts pay attention your portfolio companies directly yes. yes and fred did pull back a little bit on he his, has. 
Yeah. And he's acknowledged that. I have had to because people, you know what, I tell you, I throttled myself. Yeah. And I, it makes me wonder if I'm doing the right thing or not because I made my name mm-hmm. by being blunt and honest. That was my brand. Yeah. And now I find as I get a little bit older, I'm like, you know what? I just don't feel like giving it to Mark Zuckerberg today. I don't feel like, you know, taking out the bat and beating him up on these decisions. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it, it's for two reasons. One, I don't want to go to a party mm-hmm. and then have a bunch of people want to talk to me about that. Yep. And then number two, I feel like I know as an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, he's busting his ass. Yep. And he's probably got sleepless nights thinking about, my God, my whole thing's going to come apart. Like, I just don't have it in me to beat the guy up. Yeah. And on top of that now, imagine, Am I right or wrong? Um, I think for the most part, you're right. Your brand and what people love about yeah. you is that you talk direct when other people don't. And I mm. think you should continue to do that. Right. But there are ways to do that without necessarily poking people in the eye. And yeah. so you can it's do it. It's a hard line. Yeah, it's a hard line. But that's I would encourage you to be yourself. And I yeah. think, you know, well, that's what people value. Yeah. And I think you are. I mean, I don't need to kowtow to you, but I think you are one of the most insightful writers in our industry for that reason. Like you just say it straight. Here's what I think Yahoo should do. You know, I killed the piece. Do. I killed the piece. Okay. What was it on? It was on Scout. Okay. You know Scout? I know incredibly well. I wrote a piece on Scout. Well, tell me what you wrote. Let's talk about it here. Okay. I wrote about Scout. Because I know a lot about Scout. That this was absolutely abhorrent. Tell people first what happened. Okay. So for Scout, you tell them. Okay, so Scout is a company that is in this social, local, mobile networking or solo mo or whatever they call it. And it's basically a way to meet people around you. Now, this became a huge fad prior to South by Southwest, as you know, Highlight, and, Highlighter, was it yep, called? Highlight. And, and one, or, one or two others, right? And previously before that, it was a bit very popular in which community? Yeah, and all of a sudden you know, TechCrunch and the blogosphere was announcing that this is what's going on at South by South. The next four square, the next Twitter. Now, Scout had been doing this for three years prior to that, and I had tracked that industry a lot, and I knew that it was going to all end up being hype. But Scout is a way to meet people that are in your near area. Proximity-based. They don't allow you to pinpoint and meet someone a quarter mile from you. Right. And what happened was three... Young women uh, on I think Scout. it was one boy and two women. One boy and two women? Yeah. So three young people, I like should say. Like 12 or 13 years old. In the 13-year-old and under range yeah. were raped through and people who groomed them on the service. And this service told you where they were and gave you a pretext for, and this is what I wrote, Grindr, mm-hmm. which, which this co- service copied. Scout yep. copied Grinder. Grinder was very popular in the gay community. People in the gay community were very concerned about people being raped mm-hmm. and murdered mm-hmm. on Grinder yeah. because it was very casual and it was very fast. Yeah. You're within 100 feet of me. I see a photo of you or half a photo of you, and then we go meet, have sex, and you don't know who I am, and I could murder you yeah. uh, or drug you and then murder you, whatever. And there was this big outcry in that community. They copied the exact UI yeah. of Grinder, And I said to myself, if I, as an entrepreneur copied the exact UI of Grindr. Had people been raped or murdered yes. through Grindr? Yes, there were cases of people being raped. Now, if I was an entrepreneur, this mm-hmm. is what I wrote, and mm-hmm. I didn't publish. Mm-hmm. If I was an entrepreneur, and I built a product based on Grindr, mm-hmm. and then targeted at 13-year-olds, because mm-hmm. they did target the specific community of 13 to 18, I know as an entrepreneur that this is a dangerous service for adults. Mm-hmm. And then I made it for 13-year-olds. Mm-hmm. And I know that 11, 10, 11, 12-year-olds sneak have you, in. Have you met with the company? I have not. So let me tell you what I know from the inside. But wait, let me finish yeah, my, about my thought about what I, was, what I wrote. I literally would shut the company down, mm-hmm. and I might actually kill myself. Because I don't know if I could live knowing that I made a product that everybody knew was too dangerous, aimed it at kids, and then three kids got raped. I would literally shut the company down and I, would, I might commit suicide. I'm, I'm probably too egotistical to commit suicide, but I would then make my life's work trying to protect kids. Yeah. And then these people have relaunched the site, and they claim that proximity-based social networking is a good idea for kids. Mm-hmm. You have kids. I do. I have a kid now. If and you have a daughter or... Two boys. Two boys. I have a daughter. If your boys came home and said, I found a cool app, Dad. It allows me to meet strangers mm-hmm. based on how close they are to me. Mm-hmm. What would you do? 
I, I do want to, I will answer that question, but I do want to take the conversation okay. in a slightly different direction. Right. But anyway, but I, re, and but related. so I took this piece yeah. and I didn't publish it because I sent it to three or four people I respect. Yeah. And they said, not And a they good said, idea. Jason, this is so biting. Yeah. And you're, you're just a good writer. Yeah. And you have annihilated this company so fully that this will take over, like, just like the Facebook pieces I wrote, like, congressmen contacted mm. me about them yeah. and wanted me to testify and do stuff. It'll just take over your life. Right. And I said, I don't want my life to be taken off for a year because I wrote something that, you know, is so insightful or poignant that so, it decimates another entrepreneur. Let me tell you what I know. Okay. okay. And none of this is, I, I don't believe, super confidential. Okay. First of all, the CEO is a wonderful human being. Okay. Okay. I and that was one of the reasons I, I stopped but, myself. But let me, let me yeah. tell you. Yeah. I, I've known him for three and a half years. He is from rural Sweden, yeah. from a not wealthy community, mm -hmm. moving to the U.S. to launch a tech business um, is like a dream come true to him. He's a right. very humble guy. They assembled a very technical team. Um, when they launched, they thought this was, I mean, you have to, have to remember that initially there was, what was the Google product called? Latitude? Latitude. Latitude. Yep. And there was, what was the other really Gowala, big? Gowalla. No, 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 no. Foursquare. No, before Gowalla and Foursquare. There was a really big one in the, you know, tell, publish to people where you're going and what you're doing. I, I the name remember. escapes me. It got sold recently in a mm -hmm. high profile sale. If it comes back to me. Oh, I think it. I know. It was the one that Sam was working on out of Y Combinator, Looped. Looped, exactly the one I was looking for. Yep. So Looped. There were people, a lot of people were trying to solve this problem, and so was Christian and his team. And through the pro and it didn't initially look like it does, like I, I don't know Grindr. Right. I, 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 I don't know how much time you've spent on Grindr, but I haven't yes. spent any time on Grindr. No, I have not so, spent time. Not, My not, wife has nothing to worry about. Not that there's anything wrong with that, no. Jason. It would no. be okay with yeah. me. Well, it um, wouldn't be okay because I'm a married man. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, totally teasing. Yes, um, of course. But um, what I would say to you is, in my meetings over the years with Christian, here's the things I know. Number one, he said to me very early on, I realize now that being able to tell people where women are within close proximity is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's not a good idea because women don't want it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a good idea because of the safety issues. Right. Number two, they built a product called the Creepinator. Mm. The Creepinator has an entire team dedicated in India to reviewing every flag transaction, and mm. they built technology to review every image that ever goes through their system. If anyone gets even one black mark in the Creepinator, they ban you based on your IP address of your phone or the MAC address yeah. or the UUID. Yeah, uh, UUID. UUID on the iOS. Right. And so they put a tremendous amount of effort into it. I said to Christian, um, when I saw the app, I said, I understand why you're doing the app this way. For me, I would broaden it a little bit and not make it feel quite like booty call. Yeah. And he said to me, I agree. We're, we're working on that. We want to implement that. The problem is I haven't been able to raise capital yet. And when I raise capital, uh, we're going to start to do that. Then they raised a fortune from Andreessen and Horowitz. So, but just so you know, they yeah. worked hard not to uh, allow creeps on it. They worked hard not to allow you to finger people right. locally. But, but they had a sense, I think. But just like on Craigslist, and you know that there was a huge scandal with Habo Hotel in, did you know this? No. Oh, okay, well, you should look it up. Habo, Ho Habo Hotel, I think it's called, uh -huh. the online game company. It's based, I think, in Finland. Yep. And they had raised a bunch of money from Balderton and other people. There was a big expose about a month ago about mm -hmm. how young people were being groomed in that game and raped. <gasps> wow. And by the way, Balderton gave their money back. They just wrote off the investment. They gave, I think it was $8 million investment. They wrote it off. They didn't give their money back, sorry. They gave their equity back in the company. <gasps> wow. Now, listen, Craigslist is a haven for people who are grooming other people. Yes. Online games, it is a safety concern that everybody has. Text messaging services. Okay, so as a all of these. So all, all I should you have, should all, the entrepreneur have created a location-based proximity so let app. So let me just say, when they found out this happened, he immediately pulled it. Yeah. And what they did is they didn't allow you to talk to anyone locally. So they're now, my understanding of what they've mm. done is they've reintroduced it, but you can't, you're prohibited from talking yeah. to people if you're under 13, I think. Yeah. 
Anyway, just, it's not, I don't a, think it's they not a good situation. Yeah. I would just say, please just know that this is a good human being right. dealing with a complicated situation and but trying to make it you, better. why would you? Yeah, see, this is the problem. And by the I way, he's a parent, it. just so you know. Which, which I had emailed him, and then his PR people, the PR people from Andreessen Horowitz, got back to me, and they were, like, panicked that I was going to write a piece. And I didn't write the piece because I was like, you know what? I just don't have the energy to deal with this because it will become, like, hundreds of emails a day and all this kind of stuff. It'll take over my life, and I need to focus on Mahalo. But... I do think, why would you re-release the software? And why would you release it to begin with? I mean, th there is some indication they knew that this could be problematic. And for me, I would just not release it. I don't have enough. And then how do you live with yourself? I don't have enough. children have been raped on your service. I don't have enough money yeah. in my wallet to fund your tip jar to say all the words I would want to say, which is, go to Facebook. Right. Think of the dirtiest, nastiest terms you can and I do a search for them. Of course. I, and I'm not, you I, will I be shocked. Blamed. I would by the images you will find right. that are available to our youth. Of course. And I, so, but the fact Go that there Google is... Go to Google without, that, yes. you know... Filters. Fil the, but the fact that, you know, bad stuff exists in the world, creating stuff that is, you know, an accelerant to behaviors that you would never approve of as a parent, you know, that's the issue I have, right? Like, so it's one thing, like, you know, yes, Google has porn in it. You turn it off, they can find it. It's another thing, if you release a product, you would never let your kids use this product. I, I don't. Would you, you, you wouldn't answer that question. I would not let my kids use the product. And if they came home with that product, would you take their phones away? Or if you found them using it, would you take the phones away? I would away? take it off there. But my kids are six and nine. So here's the thing, you know, you would. as, as, as It's yes, not age appropriate. It's not age appropriate. And so if a 13, 14, 15 year old came home with this, you would absolutely take it away. But from I do believe it's it. age appropriate for 18 year olds. Exactly. So that that's my point is I think anybody who's a parent, and he's a parent, you and I as parents would never let a 13, 14, 15 year old use that product. We both think it's an 18 plus product. But for some reason, this guy who made it, who seems like a real nice guy, gave it to people under 18. I think that's the problem I had. And I, I just have a but I didn't release it. Anyway. My guess is that they're dramatically trying to carve back the number of youth using the product and dramatically trying to carve back yeah. what you can do. I, I Look, I would just say this. The problem with technology is that technology is going to happen. It is going to advance. Young people do have the tools to reach other young people, do have the ability to know location. Yeah. For example, for example. But we as in investors. Inst Instagram. Are, what, 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 no, but Instagram. What liability does the investor have? I want to talk about Instagram. But okay? what liability does Andreessen Horowitz have in backing the idea? Uh, Let's ask the hard, hard Legal question. liability? Not legal liability. Moral. moral. I don't think that they morally backed anything that was abhorrent. In hindsight, they look at it, and of course, if we knew rapes were going to take place, well, yes, one would have put in but place. But as a parent, 13, 14, 15 but, years but using but it, you, would, you wouldn't have backed it. Okay, let's come back to that, but let's talk okay. about Instagram. Sure. Okay? Here's the problem with Instagram, and I was going to write about this. I just haven't had time. Instagram, so on Facebook, hmm. you had a private community of people you share photos with. Now, I don't, I'm not friends with that many people on right. Facebook. I think I have 450 friends because I share pictures with my kid, of, of my kids. And the deal when I signed up for Facebook was this is private. And then, of course, we know they've tried to make it public. Now, the interesting thing is that say, say young people said, well, I'll be friends with anyone who re reasonably wants to be friends with me. So maybe I have 2,000 friends on Facebook. On Instagram, pretty much like Twitter, anyone can get access to your photo. Mm -hmm. So my understanding of what's happening is young boys don't take vanity photos of themselves and share them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Young girls do. Yep. So there are a lot of young girls, 13, 14, 15, 16 years Look old. Look at my outfit. Putting risque photos, MySpace-like photos of themselves on Instagram that suddenly everyone can access. So my understanding is yeah. that a lot of boys, and I'm being generic because I don't have real data, are going and downloading these risque photos of girls. Now, here's the thing. When you take pictures and share pictures through social networks, oftentimes they either have location attached to them, like you can do in on Instagram. In the photo, yeah, people don't even know that the camera has the location. Location in them. Right. Or you're giving some evidence of where the photo is. So these tools are pushing as a society, and as a society, we are going to have to deal with this issue. Yeah. And there's no way to shut it all down, so we're going to have to deal with how we educate our youth and pressure companies into implementing safeguards for youth. Let's go to questions from our audience. Well said. Um, I love, uh, this is from Nick. Uh, Nick says, I loved Mark's post and I'm making intros for the sake of intros. On the flip side, how does Mark manage what must be a huge number of intros requests for his time? How do you deal with that? Okay, I want to prepay. Oh, prepay it drives for two. me 
fucking bonkers okay. that people just start sending willy nilly. It's only ten dollars per intros. curse. You have one on it's account. Okay. I didn't have a ten on me. That's okay. You got one on account. And I'm gonna save some of it yes, that we can put, that right on the, uh, 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 put in later when I do my George Carlin routine. Yeah. Um, so, for example, it drives you effing crazy. So, so I had this conversation yesterday with a venture capitalist, mm -hmm. and he said, "Oh, I just introduced so and so to your CEO at a company I invested with," and I said, "Why?" They said, "Oh, I thought they should meet." I said, "Why?" Mm. And he said, well, there are two local CEOs and da, da, da. I said, do you realize that I spent all my time trying to get my CEO, not my CEO, but right. the CEO of the company yeah. to focus? So your CEO, that I'm the CEO trying to see of a portfolio company, yeah. but yeah. trying like hell to get this person to not be distracted. So I try not to distract them. Sure. Uh, I said, don't produce any investor reports that you don't already use for management purposes. Um, don't get, don't chase yeah. shiny objects. And you're being undisciplined just sending him an intro. Which now he feels like he has to materialize into something of for course, you. Of course, of course. No, well, he feels like he has to take the meeting. But not only does that feel like he has to take it, but he feels like he's got to report back to you or something has to come so, out of it so perhaps. So there is, there is a nuance to intros. Number one, um, for the most part, if you know you're dealing with someone super busy mm. and you know it's kind of a favor to the person who wants to get introduced, right. ask first. Yes. If, and you, I, if, you're, if, you're wa if somebody wants to be introduced to Mark Cuban, ask Mark Cuban, does he want to be introduced to that person? I almost always ask first. There are times where either I, I just – I know the people, I know it's okay – you and I'll make the yeah, executive you'll intro decision. You'll somebody to me. You don't have to ask me first. You know but I'll take the meeting. Honestly, I don't, Jason. I don't but just I would. send you. Yeah. I appreciate that. But yeah. I don't send you random people. Right. And well, I know that you wouldn't, but I, wouldn't, I would never want you to have to feel you had to send I, a pre-email. If I felt there was a compelling reason for you to meet and, I, and we had enough of a relationship, which we do, that you would trust that intro, then I might say, please meet yeah. him. But I work really hard not to send random intros. There are times where I will write my network. If I know someone's looking for a job and it's a close friend of mine who I, who I believe in, I might write to 15 people. And of those 15, I might send seven and I just send it. And I say, please do me this favor. But by the way, it'll be once a year maximum. Yep. Please do me this favor, meet. And the other seven might be so busy that I ask first. Yeah. And that's only 14. So I'm only sending 14 interests. Yeah. What do you do when you have a portfolio company you've invested in and they want to intro to, you know, well, 10 important people? It's my job to do that, Your right? Job to do that. So I have to walk a fine line and I have to say, is the person who's getting the intro to going to get enough value? How do you say no to so for example, one of the launchpad companies? Let's say you have a launchpad company. They're like, can you intro to me, to Marissa and to Larry and to Jeff Bezos? And what I would say? say it's not appropriate they're too senior like i do get that like yeah. can you introduce me to cheryl sandberg yes i have her email yes she knows who i am yes i could send an intro she's the wrong person you're wasting her time right um yeah uh two weeks ago someone asked me for an intro to ben horowitz one of my portfolio companies asked me for an intro to ben horowitz and i sent ben an email in advance and said this company would so i said to the entrepreneur send me an email i can forward mm -hmm. with a description of what you do and send me a want. deck yeah by the way, I took the deck and I cut half the slides out <laughs> just because I didn't want it to be too long. Yeah. And I sent it to Ben and I said, this is a company I really believe in. I believe it has the attributes that Andreessen Horowitz would be interested in. If you're interested in taking a meeting, let me know. I don't want to create an obligation right. for him. Yeah. I, um, what I do, Nick, who asked the question, good question, I will tell the person why I invested. That's mm -hmm. what I've started doing. So when I send something to Mark, and I send stuff to Mark Andreessen or to roll off or whatever, I'll say, this is a company that I'm advising or invested in. Here's why. I think it's an opportunity. This is why I invested. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're interested in meeting the CC, you know, the CEOs and CC and above. Right. Um, or here's their contact information. One or the other. So one, one, one edit I might make if I were yeah. you is not to CC them. Yeah. Because if you CC them, like if someone CCs someone to me and says, hey, if this is a good fit for you, meet them, I feel socially obligated. Yeah, maybe I should stop doing that. It's a good point. Yeah. I, I generally only have things that are high quality, and people know that. You still so. are creating the obligation. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It is true. So. But then I have people who say, like, send me everything you got, anything you invested in. But by the way, if in. someone says that to you, then you know you yeah. can, right? Yeah, that's true. And you know what I found that was really interesting about Andreessen and Horowitz specifically? Mark Andreessen started, or somebody who works for him, started writing to me mm -hmm. after they met with the person. 
and saying, we met with blank from blank. Mm -hmm. We passed, but we appreciate you sending it, and please keep sending us interesting things that you're investing in. Great. That's an interesting follow-up. Yeah. Like, we passed, but we're still following up. Another question from Michael um, G. What are your thoughts on having junior employees out on the street looking for deals instead of waiting for the deals to come to the VCs? This is something that only newer, unestablished firms need to do. Yeah, let's talk about that, like the hustle issue. Like, you have young people associates or whatever going to events do you find good companies like that or do you you have enough deal flow that you're pretty sure they're going to come to you everyone has their own point of view on this um my very strong point of view is that associates which is usually what they're called mm -hmm. should not be sourcing deals my belief is that associates should be helping you process do background checks do industry analysis, look at competition, make reference calls, um, and maybe even cast a wide net saying, Mark, here's 15 companies that are in the space you said you're interested in. Do any of these seem interesting? But it's my job as a partner to get my ass out to events and mm -hmm. meet with people. And honestly, it's not that I read about something in you know, on the launch or saw it at the launch conference or saw it on Business Insider that really drives whether or not it's successful. And it's not that I didn't send could invest it and therefore I should chase it because he's yeah. a super smart guy, which he is. Um, you know, often it's my judgment of the people. Mm -hmm. And how can I trust an associate who doesn't have my internal compass to make that judgment for me? Yeah, that's not really what they're I role think it's lazy be. VC. It sounds like lazy VC to me. Um, let's see. Today's this is from Jess B. Today's social networks are all about making connections, but the act of communication is still dominated by legacy technologies like email, IM, and text. Why hasn't there been any real innovation in communication realm for decades? Has there been? I think there has been. I What's would an say, example? well, think about it. Um, let's take 15 years ago. Right. Okay. 15 years ago, the Olympics would be going. And they could show us a tape delay of the Olympics because there was no way that we yeah. were going to find out the results, you know, because the only source of information was the news, right? Yeah. And the news wouldn't tell you who won or they would say, spoiler alert, don't yeah, watch. Yeah. Um, you know, think about it. There were no voicemails, you know, well, yep. maybe 20 years ago, there was no voicemail. Um, I think there, a lot has changed. Um, email itself has yeah. been a big innovation in the last 20 years for good and for bad. Yep. Uh, I think text messaging, huge innovation yeah. uh, over the last 15 DMs years. DMs with Twitter seems to be... Twitter like, DM. A lot of people with the Twitter DM. Are you one of those people who's I'm like, a Twitter DMer. God, there's some people like they're... Like, instead of texting, it's like, just let me just start DM conversations. Yeah, I and think... And like I find I, I don't look at my DMs and then I'm like, oh. So here's what I do. I turned on for Twitter all DMs to automatically text me. Oh, uh, I need to do that. So yeah. not that many people DM me. The problem is so, many, so much DM spam. Not that many. No, yeah. no. I get a lot. No, yeah. uh, I, I, well, you follow too many people. That's the problem. I, got right. I only me. follow authentic people that yeah. I want to hear from. Yeah. What do you do? Do you use a tool to I have, have a like, uh, and the list is who Peeps. you. Peeps. I have okay. a list called Peeps, and it's like a, under 1,000 people. And, and so that's people a like way. You're on that. So that's the equivalent of just having a normal follower list. That's my normal follower list is my Peeps list. And why I, do you follow all the other people? I it made people feel better, like the fans of the show, people okay. who casually were interested in me. And I will look at the mega feed of a hundred thousand people I follow and just scan it once in a while. Okay. But it's pretty noisy. Yeah. Um and so I just look at the peeps list. But it was just like an early on Twitter thing, like I'll just reciprocate, you know. Gotcha. But I think it's a mistake. I think yeah. I need to go unfollow everything and there's no like easy way to unfollow so, everything. So path. Are you a path user? I mean, I'm a huge path user. We we actually are connected now yes. on path. Yes, you just joined. Or are you I just did started not, using it? I did not just join, we just connected. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. It's so hard to find people on there. It is. And I have hundred fifty people and then They're doing so better. There now there's a way where you can click a button and it tells yeah. you who to follow. Yeah, it's starting to do that and then it but it doesn't really tell you like somebody doesn't want to follow you so why so i don't know like if evan williams isn't following me back or he just doesn't use it right you know or like i no, followed. but if you see his stuff then he's following you back because there's no not... i know that but it says like a waiting reply right and i think what it does is it permanently says a waiting reply but then i saw i would i would accept people and then i wouldn't see them and then i realized oh i'm at the 150 person limit right and i gotta go through the 150 person limit and figure out who hasn't reciprocated yeah. and unfollow them okay so it's just inefficient like it and also the 150 number is too low what do you think is the magic of path? Because I have my own view I, on this. My, I think it's two things. Conspicuous consumption and children. 
Okay. So because I can't show you a picture. I can't tweet a picture of me on a private jet. I don't have a private jet. Yeah. I don't uh, have a NetJets card. I yeah. never have paid for a private jet. But I have a dozen friends who have private jets, and once in a while I wind up on a private jet. And sometimes you take a picture of it. I don't. Yeah. But other people take pictures and they publish them. I don't do that because I feel it's kind of gratuitous. Mm -hmm. But other people I see on path are like, hey, here is my G5 and I'm getting on it, you know? Or here are my kids. I don't never post a picture of London publicly, but I will share it with my friends on path. So here's the interesting thing is I feel like with me on Facebook, I never chose to increase my network beyond people I knew. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people did. And I, they just uh, accepted everyone. And what I, so I asked on Twitter recently, I said, why do you use Path? And I was interested to hear, yeah. and the number one response is I needed a redo on my social network. Absolutely. So it's become what Facebook was intended to be in the first place. Yeah, and then Facebook got so much Twitter envy, they're like, oh, everything's public. Yeah. Remember they flipped everything public, and that was like one of the things I sort of the wrote weird, about, and weird. one of the reasons they settled with the government was they just moved everybody to public. The weird thing default. about Path, what I would tell Path mm. to change, and what I haven't written about, because again, I don't like to be negative. Right. When Path, um, but by the way, on This Week in VC, mm. I will be way more open than I will be on my blog. I think on video, I'm okay. Well, people can, this is the thing about video, I find. Like, I just had that whole discussion about Scout. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to have the discussion, I'm not afraid about having the discussion, period, but I, I'm much more comfortable with having it because people can hear the tone of my voice mm -hmm. and understand that when I write stuff, if people can just put whatever emotion they want on the words. Yeah. So I can write a sentence, I can say, listen, I, I, I feel bad for the guy, yeah. but I don't think he should have launched it. But if I write, if it, that's in text, people are like, oh, Jason is like condemning this guy without even knowing him, you know? Yeah. Um, let me say this is uh, when Path first launched, they had a 50 person limit. limit. Dunbar number. But I'll tell you, like my problem with 50 was, I'm like, well, would Jason feel weird if I told him he was one of my 50? Like. Oh, Mark, you're one yeah, of my like, 50. Yeah, really, right? like, really, like, we've never so, met each other's kids. So, like, we're business associates. Which is weird because we live so close to each exactly. other, right? We like, I always see point, you checking in at restaurants by my house. Yeah, and, exactly. And, uh, and we should change that, by the way. We should have a quick but, um, or something. Yeah. But at, at a minimum, wives, right? Yeah, wives. Well, um, and uh, I feel like, yeah, he's good. And I, I would feel comfortable sharing private stuff with Jason, but I'm like, but I only get 50. And it's not about me and do I want to see Jason. It's like, well, if I say to Jason he's one of my 50, do I look weird? Yeah, so, it's almost like I want to be too close friends to Jason or something. And so I felt yeah, like, like I, I wasn't accepting anyone because, well, no, I would accept close people yeah. who connected to me. I wasn't asking anyone. When they increased the, to 150, and when I started hearing more people were using it, then I felt it was socially acceptable. Now that they've ingrained us that it's really supposed to be a private network, I think they should lift the limit. And you know, yeah, maybe, maybe just they should. What I think what maybe, they should maybe do is, create like a 300, 400, 500. Here's person what I limit. think they should do: is if you're at 150 mm -hmm. for a month, they should add five. Mm -hmm. And they basically, as you add people Too and you're still active. Just make it automatically. Or increase. what they could do is have it be 150, you but then request. there's a button to click request 50, and you get it automatically, but it at least gets in your consciousness yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And some, the limit could be some big limit like 500. But anyway, it created weirdness. That weirdness has gone away, and now I think it's a very cool tool. What do you use it for? Well, f similar to you. I so here, I'll tell you what I liked about you Instagram. You take pictures of your private jet. <laughs> I don't you don't have, have a, a private jet. I don't have a private jet. You've done well. I've done okay, yeah. Like, you could stop working, but with a bunch of kids and stuff like that, you still haven't had a huge epic win. Or have you have, you've had a double, a single, triple? I've had doubles. You've had doubles. I'm so you're double. comfortable. I'm, I'm okay. But you're hungry. I'm hungry. Yeah. I'm hungry because... Are you I'm, a successful VC yet? You know what's How funny? many years has it been? Well, five. Five years. Yeah, and so, how would you rate yourself? Scale of one to ten? So the, the answer is on Quora, because I was asked on Quora and I responded. Okay. So I believe, first of all, that I have been successful at the first phases of being a VC. Which are? Uh, building awareness of who you are so you can increase deal flow. Absolutely. Understanding how to build a network of people who want to send you deals because they trust and respect Absolutely, you. Absolutely. I always would. Um, always I, do. I believe uh, I have a pretty good ability to pick companies. I believe that I have a well-formed strategy that I've formed over the years about the stage I want to invest, the amount I want to invest. So you have a strategy. I have a strategy. And I believe I work with my companies very well. I'm pretty hands-on. Yep. Um, and I think that works well. Now, the second phase of one's VC career 
is so first of all then the next sorry the next phase which i've now proved pretty good at is can you get follow-on investments yes and i've done fine on that so your companies have gotten their b around c around yes. d around yes. no problem it, large now, part now the 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 two last questions are one is can you get exits right and big i'm gonna exits. i'm gonna come to that yep exits exits period. we could define big in a moment and number two can you raise funds Right. Right. And we're going to get the answer to the fun question, I believe, from what I hear very soon. Very soon. Yes. And now, now, with regards to getting exits, um, I always say, so this was a question that I may or may not have been asked by LPs that I may or may not have met over the last year, sure. is how come you don't have exits? I said, if I had exits, it's because I failed. Yeah. Because I wrote my first check in March of 2009, right. which means on average, I've been investing for three and a half years. Right. If I had exits other than Instagram and like, you know, I would be delighted to have had Instagram. Sure. But other than the smashing successes, yeah. for the, the outliers, yeah. for the most part, you sell early if it's kind of like. Yeah. You don't believe in it. Koala. Yeah. It was a good company, should have succeeded, didn't quite get there. Yeah. You know, that's not going to create they a VC fund, early, yeah. right? Yeah. So for me, I believe I should be much more evaluated by LPs based on the financial performance of the companies. And I can tell you our 2008 fund mm -hmm. is the fastest growing fund we've ever had. In 2012, the revenues combined of those investments will cross $300 million wow. in revenue. You got a lot of e-commerce in there. No. No? No, no. No, I think we only have one what, what is, What's the bulk of that revenue? Is it SaaS revenue? Well, so TrueCar is a large part wow. of that. Yeah. Um, it's not all of it. It's a large part. We have two financial services companies, mm -hmm. both doing very well. Maker Studios. Yeah, crushing yep, it. That's in... Uh, I hear Maker Studios has 400 people working there. It, that's... Uh, too high of a number for reality. Oh, okay. 200 maybe. I can't quote exact yeah. numbers, but it's a lot. And a $10 million deal from the YouTube deal, so that's pretty amazing. So I would say to you that if you look across all those are doing well, and if I take the 22 companies that will be in our portfolio, you know, I have at least one or two that I think are billion-dollar companies, but wow. it's going to take eight years to get there, you know? Yeah. Um, but some of the proof will be in the pudding. You know, proof for the pudding is in the eating. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in the next 60 to 90 days, we'll be announcing major up rounds at two or three of our companies. Uh, let's talk about accelerators. Yeah. You have done Launchpad how many times? Uh, we've run it for three years. We're about to do our fourth class. And uh, that's about 10 people per class? It's exactly 10 per class. So you've done 30. Well... The first class we took more, so we've done 33. Uh -huh. 29 of them have gotten funded. Wow. Funded, defined as more than a million dollars. Yes. 29 have been funded. So seriously funded, yeah. Yep. And of them, uh, Two serious funding. 11 have been acquired. Okay. We have raised more than $120 million across the 33 companies. Okay, so average from 3 million. 20, from 20 different VCs. Okay, so it's not you just... Yeah, boosting We've had $75 million of exits. Okay, so well done. It's in the black. It's doing well. Is it in the black already or close? So Sounds close. For million. transparency, and I don't yeah. want to mislead anyone, yeah. for the first two years, we didn't give them money. Mm -hmm. We were a mentorship program. We took them in. We introduced them to so capital. It was more like office space and advisement. We didn't even have office space. Ah. We would meet once a week, either in my offices or in law mm -hmm. offices or so local. So the third time was when you put But I in. did, uh, I reviewed term sheets for people. I helped right. them with pitch decks, all the stuff you'd expect right. to so do. you earned it. And so on the third one, we did a fund. I have, obviously, there's, I think, six accelerators in town now. We have Science, which is a little bit of a different beast, more like Betaworks, Launchpad, Mucker, uh, Amplify. Amplify. Upstart LA. Upstart LA. Start IO, Engine. Start Engine. I have been bombarded mm -hmm. as an angel investor, obviously, mm -hmm. with look at all these amazing companies. Mm -hmm. I can tell you some of them have been really not high quality. Mm -hmm. Not fundable, I would say. Right. In some cases, bad ideas, bad stuff. Not from yours. Um, I really like the one that does the delivery of the high-end sous vide food. We, GRP, invested in that company. What's the name of that one? Pop-Up Pantry. Pop-Up Pantry. This is I a really good idea. I love these guys. Great I met the guy at your dinner, and I started talking to him, and he explained what they were doing, and I said, oh, do you do that with, like, sous vide bags and dry ice? Mm -hmm. He's like, how did you know that? I was like, 
Well, that's the logical conclusion anybody would come to, because how could you make it work? We led that round. Yeah, it's a very interesting idea. Um, Seventeen dollars a meal, something like that. About there. Yeah. For a gourmet meal mm-hmm. that you just put the pouch in water and mm-hmm. next you put pour it out and you got a nice great meal. It's a pretty good idea. It's a great idea. May or may not work. Yep. Like all great ideas. I think it needs to be a five pack of food for forty bucks. There are family meals. There are lots of discussions about what the configuration should be because you deal with issues of like shipping, right? That's so why I want fifty dollars worth of food. At you once. have to have high order value relative to shipping costs, but you also want a way for people to experiment and try it without having to hit forty to fifty dollar purchase. I think you got to do like it's a hundred dollars mm-hmm. a month, and you get two family style meals. We are experimenting with all price points because I would sign up for it on a regular. Right. If I knew it was going to be a great chef and I knew it was going to be like very generous amount of food that I would have leftovers the next day, I could have people over. But, but anyway, thing, I love that idea. The thing is that consumers don't realize just how much money they spend on ca- fast casual dining at crappy places. Right. And this is an opportunity to get really high quality food for cheaper and no tip. Yeah, it's kind of hard to, for people to grok. Um, but my point about the accelerators feels to me, I'll just go out and say. We're in an accelerator bubble that we could use two less accelerators in town. The right number is three, not six, I f- or maybe four. Now, I don't want to take away from those entrepreneurs in their effort. I don't want to take away from those accelerators in their effort. But I feel like we've diluted to the point at which the last 20% are not worthy of funding. I'll tell you what. Am, am I right or am I wrong? Or uh, what am I feeling? The market will sort itself out. I'll tell you what Bill Gross said to me. So Bill okay. Gross founded Idea Lab. Guy smarter than both of us. I think that Bill Gross, if you look at it, really was Y Combinator before there was Y Combinator. He was the original. Y Combinator in one guy's head. Yeah. And, uh, Largely. And he's very smart. So I called him. He might be too smart. I called him. And uh, no, he's got great social skills, too. I called him and I said, listen. Well, no, I would say he's, maybe he's too smart like because he keeps coming up with so many great ideas. But if he just did one, he'd make Google. Um, well, he did create the business model for Google. Absolutely. As you know. He invented. But I mean, paid, like he did Aptera. He invented the, uh, paid search, right? He did. And, and but then, then he did Aptera, which would be like Tesla, like, and, but he didn't like stick with it. He's got that like ADD investor. I mean, he's brilliant. But anyway, let's move on. Keep going. Um, what did he so say? So I called Bill and yeah. I said, should I do Launchpad again? Right. When we started, there was no one in town. Now there's all these things. Maybe I ought to just be an elder statesman and try to help them all. Yeah, you're the trying, guy who funds them. Which I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be you are open to all it. of them. And what he said to me is he said, Mark, what makes Silicon Valley Silicon Valley is so many people trying. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But what we want to encourage is more people to try. And from uh-huh. that, there will be good ideas and bad ideas, good accelerators, bad ideas. But what he said to me was, Mark, you have a mission to try and help more entrepreneurs. And if you pull out of the market, I think you're doing a disservice to that. So I said, if you really believe that, then why don't you invest in Launchpad alongside me? Mm. And he did. Yeah. But I think he was right about, like, sometimes I wish, because you and me, our brains, like, already leap to where we know the end game is. Yeah. And I just said, gosh, if there could just be three of these. And I sort of feel like that. I think that's what will happen over time. But, but the inefficiency is part of the process. But they're all talented. I mean, Mike Jones and science. Well, that one's going to be a clear winner. Paul Gre- Brico at Amplify, clear talented. Winner, yeah, I think we're winner. doing great things at Launchpad. Yeah, Eric Rinala at Mucker. I mean, there's, yeah. there are just talented I mean, people in town. It is. It is. It's growing pretty quickly. Um, so this week in venture capital, starting up again soon. Yes. We're going to do another season. We've got sponsors. So it's and not going to come start... to you. I basically here. Let me tell you yep. because this is like uh, interim CEO of this okay. weekend to talent. I'm going to take any because this is my challenge. I've got to get guys like you. Yep. Who are too busy. Yep. To do the shows because the shows only work when you have somebody who is a massive expert. Ian Rogers doing. Music, or, music, or yeah. you doing venture capital, or me doing startups. It only works with somebody who's really got credibility. But those people with credibility have so many other things to do, Launchpad, venture capital, et cetera. And two kids. And two kids, et cetera. I have to make it ultra convenient for you. Yeah. And ultra worth your time, because I can never make it worth your time 
on a monetary basis. Sure. So it has to be for those other reasons. So as I told you, my commitment is whenever you need somebody, I'm going to have people run over with cameras and yeah, I appreciate grab that. it and make it like super pleasurable for you. You have to, the other side is you have to tell me what I can do to make you keep doing the show. So uh, just what do you so, think I should do with this company? Just so everybody knows, monetarily, I don't take anything and never no, have. No, you ne never, never have. have taken right. a penny. I'm not interested in that. But um, for me, doing the show is a pleasure and I'm right. happy to do it. And I love taking, you know, listener calls or getting tweets, asking question after. Um, it's the booking a guest, planning their time, mm. writing up the show notes afterwards. Yes, that's market, why I got producers Marketing now. the show, telling yeah. people about it, building up a fan list. That's the time-consuming right. bit. Right, and I built up the, the producers. Show is easy. Yeah. Now we're going to do timestamps for you. We're going to do emails for you. We're going to book a guest for you. For this week in VC in particular, I can't do it legitimately without taking the show to Silicon Valley. Right. Because I can call the Which is what I learned, say, yeah. which is I learned. I can say when you're in L.A., stop by – but it's much easier if I take the show on the road. I, I started getting a whole new caliber of guests when I started going up to the Valley yeah. and just using a studio there. And I'm trying to build a studio there. Okay. I want to get my own studio up there. So I've been talking to three or four people who have space that could give me a studio. If anybody out there has a space, I need about, I don't know, 1,500 square feet, like a large conference room at your space. And then I bring in all these incredible people. So we have one person we're pretty close to. I think we're about 80, 90 percent. We'll probably you close. need soundproofing if you don't have soundproofing. Of course, yes. If we can do it, as you can see here, this is a this is a conference room, and we just make these boards with the soundproofing. You buy the soundproofing, you put it up, and you get the five hundred dollar microphone. But the great thing, but I need a permanent. The great room. advantage for someone who wants to donate this facility to mm -hmm. you is really legitimately everybody comes in, and you have the opportunity before Shake and after hands. the show. To say Shake hello. hands, kiss me. I mean, I did it at Rocket Space, and I've done it at CNET, and boy, did I bring in the top celebrities to each of those places in the in our world, right. top VCs, top stuff. So yeah, if anybody has this listening, that's what we need. But so we're not going to start the show next week. Okay. We're going to start it the following week. Perfect. And um, awesome. I'm so really excited. So I guess excited. that's the week of August the uh, Yeah. And what you do is you go up to, um, when you go up there, I, I, I fly up one of the producers. Great. It cost me 200 bucks to fly them. They don't even stay overnight. They fly in the morning. They come back at night. I get them Ubers. They feel like they're blowing it out, paying for a $60 Uber, whatever. And then uh, awesome. we're, gold, we're golden. Done. All right. We'll see you next time. Thank you great. so much to for having Mark me. Suster for being so honest. What a great, great discussion. Everybody go check out uh, his Twitter feed, M. Suster, S-U-S-T-E-R. And of course, both sides of the table dot com, both sides of the table dot com. It's a blog I read uh, regularly. That's awesome. And this being in venture capital coming back. And he's been doing it since June 2010. And because, I mean, really, people were hammering you on Twitter. You have to come back. They you have to do. come back. They you have do. to come back. What a great show. <laughs> it's like I'm development. glad I suckered you into doing yeah. it. Uh, now you have this fan base that is, like, going to take over your life. Uh, thank you to... Mail, no, not MailChimp today, but a thank you to them. Squarespace. Squarespace and, and GoToMeeting. Go to oh, God, two great products. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups.